When they get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, they are more terrified than even when they thought they were going to die. See, there is a fear that Jesus brings. And you have to understand the fear that Jesus brings before you can experience the fear that Jesus relieves. Welcome to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. I'm David Pick. I'm glad you could be with us today. And Colin, we come to a message here from Mark chapter 4. Jesus and his disciples are in a storm in a boat. When we hear this story, it should cause us to think. It really does. And the thing that's so striking to me is that uh, obviously uh, it was a terrifying experience for these disciples to be caught in the storm. They thought they were going to die. Yeah. But when uh, Jesus calms the storm, they're even more terrified. And Jesus says, well, now why are you so afraid? And it's because they realize who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They're in the presence of God Almighty. God himself in the flesh is right here with us in this boat. That's absolutely terrifying. And uh, there is a fear that the awareness of God actually brings. The Bible speaks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This person is God. And that's a huge part of them being formed as disciples. They're in the process. It's only later that Peter says, well, now you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But they learn to have an awe, a fear, a reverence of this Jesus, not to take him lightly, nothing flippant here. This is the son of God. And then he's going to cast out spirits and then he's going to raise the dead. Well, you're walking with that person. You're never going to take that person lightly. So join us, if you can, in Mark chapter 4. As we begin the message, Jesus delivers his people from fear. Here's Colin. Let me just try and remind us where we've come to in Mark's gospel at this point. You remember that Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near. That's chapter 1 and verse 15. The blessing of life under the rule of God. That's how we're describing the kingdom of God. It's come very near, and so it was in many wonderful evidences of the inbreaking blessing of God's rule through the ministry of Jesus. But then we saw something terrible happen, really, and yet within God's sovereign purpose, the ministry of Jesus is rejected. The Pharisees and the Herodians plot to kill Jesus. The official delegation of scholars come down from Jerusalem and they say he's in league with the devil. And so at the beginning of Mark chapter 4, we came last week to the question, what hope is there for the kingdom in a world that rejects the king? And we saw that Jesus answers that question in four parables or stories recorded in Mark chapter 4. We looked just at the first of these last week and we learned that Jesus will establish his kingdom through the living seed of his word, which will raise a great harvest. That was last week. Now, these four parables of how, about how the kingdom comes are followed by four miracles that describe for us what the kingdom will be like. And these four miracles, just so you have them in your mind, are first that Jesus calms the storm, that is chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Second, that Jesus casts out demons from a very disturbed man, that's chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Third, that Jesus heals a woman of a sickness that she has suffered for 12 years. That's verses 25 to 34 that were read. Fourthly, Jesus raises a young girl from the dead. And that story is very significantly split into two parts with a delay in the middle. We'll see the significance of that later. Verses 21 to 24 and then verses 35 to 43. Now, these four miracles that we're going to uh, cover today really give us a sample of the kingdom. That is, a taste of what the blessing of life will be like under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to think together about what it will be like when Christ comes in his power and glory, when the kingdom comes. We pray, may your kingdom come. Oh Lord, we prayed that this morning. What will it be like when Jesus Christ returns in power and glory and brings in his kingdom? Four things. Number one, no storms. The whole created order transformed. A world with no tsunamis, no Hurricane Katrinas, no prospect or fear of an earthquake, a tornado. In the book of Revelation, John was given a glimpse 
of what it will be like under the rule of Christ, and he saw that the sea was like glass. Now, you see the significance of that. No more storms. Turbulence gone. Fear gone. And Jesus gives just a sample of that in this wonderful miracle of calming the storm. Verse 37 of chapter 4, there's this furious squall that comes up suddenly on the lake. Jesus rebukes the wind, the waves settle, and there was, verse 39, complete calm. No storms. Secondly, no demons. Imagine a world where Satan is cast out. A world without evil, a world without hatred, a world without violence. Imagine a world where there is no guilt, no temptation, no failure, no regret. Imagine a walk with God in which there is no need for repentance. Imagine being completely free to pursue everything God calls you to pursue without hindrance, without struggle, and without restraint. No storms, no demons. Third, no sickness. Imagine a world without cancer, a world without strokes, a world where no one is blind or deaf or lame. A world without mental disorders. Imagine a world with no depression. No sickness at all. Simply health and strength to enjoy our creator God. And to enter into all the glory that he has prepared for his people. And imagine a world with no death. No more fear. No decline in the body. No aging process, no fear of the future. Above all, no gut-wrenching goodbyes. Imagine such a world. Put these together, you see, and you have a picture of life under the blessing of Christ's rule. This is how it will be for all Christ's people when the kingdom comes. This is what is ahead of you as your eternal future in Jesus Christ. No wonder the Lord Jesus says, pray, your kingdom come. Hasten the day, Lord, when there will be no storms and no demons and no sickness and no death. Lord Jesus, come quickly. And to that, every Christian person says, amen. Now, we might also be saying at this point, yes, But that is such a long way from the reality of our lives now. And of course it is. We are living in a world that is scarred by storms and demons and sickness and death. But what else would you expect to experience in a fallen world that rejects the king? We await the day when his kingdom comes, when Jesus Christ returns in power and glory. But when he comes, we want to be part of his kingdom, which is why we submit ourselves to the king in our lives here and now. And here is the good news for every disciple of Jesus in this world of storms and demons and sickness and death. Until he comes and makes everything new, you and I share this wonderful promise that Jesus Christ is with us in everything we experience in this world. To use the picture from this wonderful story that Mark tells us, Christ is in your boat when you face the storm. Christ is with you when you face great evil. Christ will be with you when you prepare for surgery. As you live with a debilitating condition, he is with you in that And he will be with you when you face death or when you go through the awful experience of the loss of a loved one and you wonder how you can carry on. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you will enjoy the full blessing of life under Christ's rule forever when he comes in power and glory. And that will be a life of no storms, no demons, no sickness, and no death. Until then, 
This precious gift is yours that Jesus Christ is with you in every storm that you face, in the face of every evil, in every sickness, and even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even there he will be with you and he will comfort you. That is his unshakable promise. And so here is the blessing of placing your life under the rule of Jesus Christ. It is just the beginning of all that will be yours as you submit yourself to the king. So when his kingdom comes, he will bring you into all the blessing of his glorious kingdom forever. Now, that's really an overview of these four stories and what they teach us. Remember the pattern of what we're seeing in Mark. The question is, how will the kingdom come in a world that rejects the king? And we've seen four parables that all tell us how the kingdom comes, and now four miracles that tell us what the kingdom looks like, what it will look like when Jesus comes in power and glory. That's the overview. You're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith, and we have to pause there briefly, but when we come back, we'll hear how one theme runs through all four of those stories. So stay with us if you can. You're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith, and a message called Jesus Delivers His People from Fear. It's part of a series called The Gospel According to Jesus, and if you've missed any of the series so far, or if you want to go back and listen again, you can do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk, or find us as a podcast. Those are on all the regular podcast sites, and you can find them by searching for Open the Bible UK. Back to the message now. We're in Mark and chapter 4. Here's Colin. Now, I want us at this point to kind of swoop down and to look more closely at one theme that runs throughout all four of these stories. And because it's in all four, it's obviously of great importance. And that is the theme of fear. And I want us to notice today that there is a fear that Jesus brings... And we'll see that in the first two stories. And then a fear that Jesus relieves, and we'll see that in the last of the two. First then, a fear that Jesus brings. Now, I want us to look here at Mark chapter 4 in verses 40 and 41. A furious storm has uh, blown up on the lake. Jesus has rebuked the wind. The waves have settled, and the lake is completely calm. And after this miracle, in verse 40, Jesus said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples said to him, You're absolutely right. We shouldn't have panicked, and we won't do that again in the future, we promise. (laughs) Is that what your Bible says? No. No, it is not. What, What does the Bible say? See, let's look at it here. Verse 41. Jesus says, Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, terrified, and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is astonishing. They were absolutely scared stiff when the storm blew up, but when it calmed down, Mark is telling us they were even more terrified. Scared when the storm was blowing up to the point that they thought they were going to die. But more terrified still. The word is really intense. They're terrified when they realize that they are in the presence of an awesome power in Jesus Christ that at this point they do not yet quite understand. When they get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, they are more terrified than even when they thought they were going to die. Now that should make us stop and think. See, there is a fear that Jesus brings. And you have to understand the fear that Jesus brings before you can experience the fear that Jesus relieves. Fear is the natural response of a human being in the presence of Almighty God. I was thinking uh, through the week as I prepared for today, You know, some of the times when I've really been scared, and I could think of a number. Let me just give you a couple that came to mind. I remember walking among a field of cows some years ago in England and then realizing there was a huge bull there. And I began to walk away, 
and then realized he was following me. He realized it was 50 yards to the fence, and I thought, I think I can make it. And this was a foolish thing to do. I ran, and of course, you know what the bull did. <laughs> and uh, I can still remember my heart beating, and, uh, you know, I did survive. <laughs> um, but I tell you, it was a close shave. I remember going to a conference on the south coast of England, and... Uh, you know, you get these crazy ideas when you go and you're in a different routine. I thought, you know, I'm really going to do something different. Swim in the sea early morning. Got up at the crack of dawn, went out, swam in the sea. Went away out from shore. There wasn't a soul to be seen. It was a wonderful experience until I turned and began to swim back towards the shore. And after 15 minutes, realized I was no closer than when I had begun to swim back. I'd been caught in a tidal current. And I still remember the sense of panic. And there isn't a soul here. And I'm getting tired, and I'm no nearer the shore. Fear. Well, I did survive, um, you <laughs> understand. But listen, if I would be afraid of a charging bull or an ocean tide, what should I feel in the presence of the God who made them? Well, what scares you? Spiders? Thunder and lightning? Ten-foot snakes, being caught in an earthquake, a volcano, a tsunami, a storm of meteors piling on the earth. Well, what would you expect to feel in the presence of the God who made them? I know there'll be some guys who are sitting here thinking, I'm not scared of anything, actually. I wouldn't have been scared of the bull pastor. I think that's a little bit pathetic. I'm the kind of guy that likes to go on the bull run that they have, you know, and run in front of these things charging just for kicks. Well... Being in the presence of God, you would experience fear. These disciples were tough guys. They were fishermen. And when they saw the power of Jesus Christ in their boat, that near, they were, Mark says, terrified. They were. Now, honestly, that's what you find in the Bible whenever a person is in the immediate presence of God. The beginning of the Bible, what do you find Adam doing in the garden? He's hiding from God, scared stiff to come out in the open. The end of the Bible, John the Apostle, who had leaned, the gospel says, back on Jesus at the Last Supper, so couldn't have been much closer to Jesus in his earthly life, Nobody could have been closer to Jesus than John was. And yet when John sees Jesus' glory, the glory of the risen Christ, what does he do? He falls at, on his face. John says, I fell on my face as if I was dead. And he's one who knows and loves Jesus. That's the beginning and the end of the Bible. What about the middle? Isaiah the prophet. And he sees the glory of the Lord. And his immediate reaction is to say, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. Woe to me, I can't live in the sheer intensity of this holiness, this glory, this awesomeness of who God is. Fear is the natural response of a human being in the presence of Almighty God. To fear the Lord... It's a simple description. What does it mean to fear the Lord? To fear the Lord is simply to know who He is and to realize what it would be to stand in His presence. Have you ever really thought about how absolutely terrifying it would be to stand in the presence of Almighty God? Now, let me tell you straight away that this is a good kind of fear. It's the fear that Jesus brings. And it's a fear that every living person desperately needs to discover. Because the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this is a good kind of fear. People who do not fear the Lord simply don't know who he is. And we're going to see that the fear of the Lord is not a fear that will cripple you in your life. It is rather a fear that will enable you to overcome every other kind of fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the presence of Jesus brings the disciples into 
the feet of the Lord. You see the same thing in um, the second story. Let me just overview it very quickly, and you can read it later. Uh, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, the second miracle, which is where Jesus casts out many demons. And uh, you get a sample of the problem that this man was and that he experienced from verses 4 and 5, where we read that this man who was possessed by many demons had often been chained hand and foot. But no one was strong enough to subdue him, and so night and day you find him out there in the tombs and in the hills, and this man, who must have gone around naked, cut himself with stones, and he would cry out and shriek. Can you imagine living in the town with this guy out there at night and hearing the sound of his voice like the sound of a a wolf? And no one could chain him. Scary. And when Jesus arrives, he identifies the evil powers that have possessed this man, and he casts them out. And Mark records the wonderful transformation that happens in the life of this man. Verse 15, the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons was sitting there, and he's dressed. And he's in his right mind. And all the people of the town come out and say, Jesus, thank you. You have delivered us from our greatest fear. And so now please come and stay in our town and deliver us from many other evils also. Right? No, that is not what the Bible says. What what is the response of the people? Verse 15. They see this marvelous transformation. And the man's now dressed and in his right mind. And verse 15, what? They were afraid. And verse 17, they began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. They're more afraid of the authority of Jesus and what that will mean in their lives and in their town than they were afraid of the disturbance that this man had brought to their community for many years. So, Jesus leaves, and the Gerasenes remains a dark place because light has come, and they have chosen darkness rather than light. And there goes the story of our world. That is the truth, isn't it? Pastor Colin Smith on Open the Bible, they're talking about the fear that Jesus brings. Our message is called, Jesus Delivers His People From Fear. And so next time we're going to look at the fear that Jesus relieves us from. So I hope you'll join us for that. The message is part of our series, The Gospel According to Jesus. And if you've missed any of the series so far, or if you want to go back and listen again, you can do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk. There you'll find all the previously broadcast messages. You'll also find Open the Bible Daily, and that's a series of daily reflections based on Pastor Colin Smith's teaching, and read in the UK by Sue McLeish. Well, Open the Bible is a listener-supported programme, and that means exactly what it sounds like. It's your generosity that keeps Pastor Collins' teaching on this station and online. If supporting Open the Bible in that way is something you'd like to begin doing, and you're able to set up a monthly direct debit of £5 per month or more, or a one-off gift of £50 or more, we'd love to say thank you by sending you five copies of Pastor Collins' new booklet, What Jesus Says to Skeptics. That's one copy for you to read, and four to give away to your friends and family. Colin... How would you describe a sceptic? Well, I think a sceptic is someone who would not at this point say that they've made a commitment of faith, but on the other hand, they've not rejected the Lord Jesus Christ either. They're somewhere in between. There are some real questions. And the good news is that Jesus cares deeply about sceptics. And we find this in John's Gospel where he engages with people who have honest questions and he does it in such a way as to give them stepping stones to faith. And that's the aim of this little booklet to show what Jesus says to skeptics. And if you've got honest questions or if you know someone who has honest questions about the Christian faith, then I hope and pray that this booklet will be useful to you. 
This booklet is called What Jesus Says to Skeptics, and it's our gift to you for beginning to support Open the Bible this month. If you set up a new direct debit of £5 per month or more, or a one-off gift of £50 or more. You can give online and find full terms and conditions at our website, that's openthebible.org.uk. For Pastor Colin Smith and Open the Bible, I'm David Pick, and I hope you'll join us again next time. Fear is the natural response of human beings in the presence of God, but the fear of the Lord will not disable you. Find out why next time on Open the Bible.